25. And of course, I'm a hot mess for the rest of the day. I'm so far gone, it's not even funny. My head is just mush. Actual mush. And it would be one thing if it only happened in Abby's physical presence, but it's way beyond that. It's everything I do and everywhere I go. People try to talk to me, and I don't even hear them. Simon intercepts me on my way to the buses. Come on, I'm driving you home. You don't have to do that. It's not a question. Let's go. He hooks his arm around my shoulders and turns me toward the parking lot. Then he walks me the whole way there, like I'm a frail, stumbling great-grandmother. You're ridiculous, I inform him. He opens the passenger door for me. Are you going to click my seatbelt for me, too? I add. Very funny. So, where's Nora? I ask when he finally slides into the driver's seat. Funny you should ask. Funny how? Well, by funny, he explains. I mean, not at all funny. Ah. Uh. He backs slowly out of his parking spot, lips pressed together. Is everything okay? I say after a moment. What? Oh, yeah. I'm just... He shakes his head. Did you know she's going to prom? Nora? Simon nods. Oh. With Cal? He stops at a light, turning to me incredulously. You knew about it? No, but they were pretty flirty during the play. No, they weren't. I would have noticed. I always notice this stuff. I snort out loud, and he narrows his eyes. What? Nothing. Humph. So, are they dating? I ask. He sighs. I don't know. Want me to ask her? I'll ask. I don't care. It's just weird, right? He says, nodding earnestly. He liked me. And you have a boyfriend. Which, speaking of, have you talked to Bram yet? No, but I will. And, Leah, God, you know I'm not jealous, right? I'm just saying, it's weird. I don't think it's weird at all. You and Nora look a lot alike. Simon smacks the steering wheel. That's why it's weird. The dude has a type. I don't like it. I think you just don't like the idea of your little sister hooking up with someone. They're not hooking up. I shake my head, smiling. But she keeps staying after school with him for yearbook, and now he's giving her a ride home like every day. A.K.A. they're hooking up. Simon huffs. No, they're not. He turns onto Roswell Road, and for the next five minutes, we drive in silence. I don't say a single word until he pulls into my driveway. Seriously, are you okay? I ask finally. What? Yeah. You need to talk to Bram. I know. Like, now. Today. He nods slowly, jaw clenched. This is stupid. I should just turn in my deposit for NYU, right? Simon, I can't make this decision for you. I shake my head. Then I grab his hand and tug it. All right, come on. You want me to come in? His brow furrows. Yep. Um, yeah. Simon nods quickly. Wow, I don't think I've actually been inside your house in years. I'm aware, I say, feeling stupidly self-conscious. It's not a secret that I'm not rich. And Simon's not going to judge me for having a small house, or clutter, or crappy second-hand Ikea furniture. But I'm just weird about having people over. It's like I can't help but be acutely aware of the stains on the carpet and my mismatched bedding. Or even just the fact that my whole room is the size of Simon's closet. We walk in through the garage, and he follows me down the hall. I can't even remember what your room looks like, he says. It's really small, just warning you. Then I open the door and step into my room. Simon lingers in the doorway. This is amazing, he says softly. I look at him to see if he's kidding. Did you draw all of these? He walks toward the wall, peering closely at one of my sketches. Some of them. Some are from the internet. My walls are covered with art, pencil sketches and carefully inked character portraits, and chibis and yaoi. If I fall in love with something on deviant art, I print it. Or sometimes Morgan and Anna print them and give them to me. And I guess lately, more and more of them are mine. My Harry and Draco sketches, Haruka and Michiru, my original characters, and the picture I drew of Abby and me at Morgan's house. I hope to God Simon doesn't notice that. This room is so you. 
he says, smiling. I guess. He flops backward onto my bed. That's the thing about Simon. He feels totally at home wherever he goes. I stretch out beside him, and we both stare at my ceiling fan. Then Simon covers his face and sighs. Hey, I say. Hey, I know you're worried. He sniffs and turns his head to look at me. There's a tear streaking down his cheek, sliding out from under his glasses. He wipes it away with the heel of his hand. I just don't like goodbyes. I know. I don't want to leave him or you or Abby or any of you guys. His voice catches. I don't know anyone in Philly. I don't know how people do this. I feel my throat start to tighten. I think I'm even going to miss Taylor. Okay, now you've lost me. He laughs and sniffs again. Come on, you know you'll miss her. How are we going to know if her metabolism is still rocking? Probably from her daily Instagram updates. Okay, that's true. And that's a conservative estimate. I know. He scoots toward me, so close our heads are touching. Then he sighs quietly into my ear, ruffling my hair with his breath. I don't think I've ever loved him more. We just lie there like that, watching the fan move in circles. I should tell him. Right now. I don't think there's ever been a moment in history that was more perfect for coming out. But I don't. It's the weirdest thing. I'm lying in a room with my gay best friend, who's 100% likely to be completely fucking cool about this. Literally risk-free. But it's like the words won't come. 26. And then there's the issue of Nick. Despite his Waffle House meltdown, he's totally normal on Monday and Tuesday. So normal, it's almost concerning. But on Wednesday afternoon, he skids straight off the edge. I'm heading toward the buses when I hear, unmistakably, Nick's voice over the intercom. Simon Spear and Leah Burke, please report to the atrium immediately. I stop in my tracks, staring at the loudspeaker. I repeat, Simon and Leah, report to the atrium immediately. I have no clue what he's playing at, but I head up there anyway. I catch Simon in the stairwell. What's this about? he asks. I shake my head slowly. No idea. I follow Simon upstairs and into the atrium. It's teeming with people, laughing, jostling, and streaming out to the parking lot. But Nick isn't anywhere. I mean, I guess he must be somewhere. To be honest, he's probably suspended by now, because we definitely aren't allowed to use the intercom. Do you think he's pranking us? asks Simon. I mean, I tilt my head. If he is, I don't get it. But moments later, he bursts out of the front office, looking wild-eyed and disheveled. Hey, you're here. Cool, cool. Simon peers at his face. Are you okay? What? Totally. He nods quickly. Totally. For a moment, no one speaks. So, what's going on? I ask finally. Nick's eyes scan the room. And then he pauses. Are you guys free right now? I am, Simon nods. Okay, good. Because I need you, he points at me, and you, he points at Simon, and me, to go to my house and eat shitty food and play video games. Just like old times. No Abby, no Bram, no Garrett. Okay, Garrett and I aren't... He cuts me off. Just us. The original trio. Just us, Simon echoes. Okay, let me text Nora. If you can give me a ride, I'll leave her the car. Excellent, says Nick, clamping a hand on each of our shoulders. Simon's eyes flick toward me nervously. None of us speaks as we drift through the parking lot. The sky is dark and gloomy, with gray clouds hanging low. I swallow a prickle of dread as I slide into the passenger seat. It's only a short drive to Nick's house, and Simon fills the space with frantic chatter about Nora and Cal, about tuxedo rentals. Nick doesn't say a word. He pulls straight into his garage and takes the spot where his mom usually parks. They're both on call all night, he informs us. And there's beer. So, it's that kind of night. Nick grabs a six-pack and his acoustic guitar and heads down to the basement. I curl into one of the video game chairs, and Simon sprawls out on the couch. But Nick bypasses everything comfortable, opting instead for the floor where he crosses his legs and starts tuning his guitar. Then he takes a sip of beer and does a few experimental strums, his shoulders finally relaxing. 
Um, Nick? Simon says after a moment. Why are we here? You mean evolutionarily or existentially? Simon's brow furrows. I mean, why are we in your basement? Because we're friends, and that's what friends do. We hang out in basements. He strums a chord and takes a long swig of beer. Also, everyone else sucks. He actually sings that last word instead of saying it. And he sets the beer down, repositions his guitar, and starts playing a melody so intricate, my eyes can't keep up with his hands. Simon slides off the couch and settles in next to Nick on the floor. Okay, this sounds really great. It sounds like shit, Nick says, fingers still tearing across the frets. But he grins. Simon pauses. Seriously, are you okay? Nope. Do you want to talk about it? Nope. Okay, Simon says. He looks up at me desperately. I lean forward in my chair. Nick, you're freaking us out. Why? Because you're acting super weird. No, I'm not. He strums a loud chord. I'm just, chord, making music, chord, with my two best, chord, friends. Then his hands fall suddenly still. You know what's really awesome? Simon looks hopeful. What? The fact that from now on, for the rest of my life, I can tell people I got dumped two weeks before prom. Yikes. I look at Simon. He puffs out his cheeks and then exhales loudly. Hilarious, right? I look at him. Not really. I was in love with her, he says, his voice eerily calm. And now she's totally over it. Like, whatever. Just like that. I don't think that's... Simon starts to say. I'm just saying, do you even know what it's like to be in love with someone like that? I almost choke. Dude, I'm like seriously worried about you right now, Simon says. He glances at me again. Why? I'm fine. Nick smiles brightly. I'm totally fine. You know what I need? What? He sets the guitar down and chugs the rest of his beer. Then he grabs another beer and chugs that one, too. That, he says, beaming. God, I'm feeling so much better already. Okay, Simon says uncertainly. Good, Nick gasps. I just had an idea. What? We should play soccer. Um, yeah, okay, this is a great idea. We're totally doing this. Nick nods eagerly. Let me get my balls. Ha, <laughs> my ball. Simon catches my eye and shakes his head wordlessly. For a minute, we just sit there, listening to Nick hum as he pokes around his storage closet. Already, he's working on a third beer. And it's not like I've never seen Nick drunk before, but I've never seen him this unhinged. Got it, he announces, emerging triumphantly with a soccer ball. This is going to be amazing. But it's raining, says Simon. Nick smiles. Even better. He slips through the basement door, out into the backyard, and starts kicking the ball gently from one foot to the other. It's not actually raining, but the air is thick and humid. Come on, he says. Leah, I'm passing to you. Remind me why we're doing this. Because we are, he says. Then with a firm thud, he kicks the ball in my direction. I swing my foot half-heartedly, missing it by a mile. Okay, okay, nice hustle, Nick says, clapping his hand against his fist. I circle back to the ball, pick it up, and walk it back toward him. Nick laughs. You have to kick it. Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. He sets the ball down. Did you know Abby and I used to do this all the time? She's, like, really good at soccer. He doesn't wait for us to react. She is. She's really, really good. But guess what? Neither of us speaks. He grins. She broke up with me! Then he kicks the ball so hard it smacks against his neighbor's fence. Nick, Simon says, taking a step toward him but Nick pulls away suddenly, jogging after the ball. Then he dribbles it back. You know, it's good, though. It's all good. Wasn't going to work anyway, because long-distance relationships are the fucking worst. Am I right? Simon winces. Right. No, they're not. I say quickly. Yeah, they are, Nick says. He kicks the ball to Simon. They're doomed before they even start. Not necessarily. I look pointedly at Simon. If you commit to making it work, it can work. 
Simon frowns, staring straight ahead. Dude, you're supposed to kick it back. Oh. Simon's eyes cut to the soccer ball, and he gives it a half-hearted nudge with his foot. It rolls two feet and stops. Have you talked to Abby at all? Nope, not interested. Nick grins. Don't care enough. You don't care. Simon sounds dubious. Do you know how many girls there are at Tufts? Nick asks calmly. A lot? Millions. Millions and trillions. He taps the ball with his toe. I mean, honestly, Abby did me a favor. Simon's eyes flick toward mine. Anyway, I'm already over her, Nick adds. Yeah, Nick, you really seem over her. Totally normal, and totally not having an epic fucking meltdown. God. I'm not an idiot, but wow, I'd love to believe him. Because if Nick were really over Abby, then maybe I'm not an asshole for hoping. Not for anything soon, obviously. Just maybe down the line, in a month or two, when things aren't quite so raw. I could kiss her for real. Nick slams his foot back into the ball, sending it flying toward the house. Maybe not. This time Simon runs to fetch it. So, Leah, you're the one with all the romantic intrigue now, Nick says, and it's like someone smashing their fist on a piano. My heart sinks into my ribcage and drops out of my chest entirely. What are you talking about? My voice comes out soft. Come on. He rubs the bridge of his nose. You know Garrett has the biggest crush on you ever. But don't tell him I told you, he adds suddenly. I'm not supposed to tell you that. That's okay. My stomach wrenches and I have the sudden sinking feeling that I might burst into tears. Which is crazy. I should be happy, or flattered, or something. You guys should hook up at prom. That's like the ultimate high school achievement, right? You mean the ultimate high school cliche, I say flatly. Well, you should do it, Nick says. I don't want to. You don't want to what? Simon asks, returning with the ball tucked under his arms. Guys, how many times do I have to say it? Stop carrying the fucking ball around. Simon drops it. I don't want to hook up with Garrett, I say, louder than I mean to. It comes out like a declaration. And suddenly, I feel so certain about this, it almost takes my breath away. I press a hand to my cheek. I don't want to kiss Garrett. Simon laughs. Okay, then don't. Nick kicks, and the ball rolls quietly toward me. My thoughts are quietly rolling, too. I don't want to kiss Garrett. I don't want to kiss anyone. Except her. Which would be the wildest, most reckless, worst idea ever. I might as well stomp all over Nick's heart and then stomp all over my own. I can't actually fall for a straight girl. I can't fall for my best friend's ex-girlfriend. I take a breath. And the ball? I crash into it. I kick it like banging a drum. I kick it so hard, it flies halfway to the moon. 27. Simon's acting weird, Bram says on Thursday, chin in hand. He and Garrett and I have claimed a table in the corner of the library. It's like there's something he's not telling me. Maybe he's gay, Garrett whispers. Yeah, I've been wondering that. Bram's so deadpan when he says it that I can't help but smile. But God, I can't believe Simon hasn't told him. Does he really think the distance between New York and Philadelphia is a deal breaker? We're not talking Paris or Tokyo. This is literally an hour and a half on the train. I don't know, Bram says finally. Garrett looks at me and shrugs. And it hits me, all of a sudden, how strange it is to be spending a morning in the library with these two. Not Simon and Nick, not Morgan and Anna. Just Bram, Garrett, and me. That wouldn't have happened a year ago. I don't think it would have happened six months ago. Burke, I can't tell if you're staring into space or staring at Taylor's ass. Definitely Taylor's ass, I say automatically. I blink, and there she is, a couple of yards away from us. She's crouched down and appears to be helping a freshman sort through an array of scattered papers. Sometimes I forget what a Girl Scout she is. I think she's into Eisner, Garrett murmurs. I nod. Agreed. But what about Abby? Bram asks. Garrett shrugs. I mean, she dumped him. He's a free agent. I guess so. 
Bram chews on his lip. Prom's going to be interesting. Yeah, with Eisner and Suso in the same limo? Guaranteed shit show. You think it will be bad? For them? Yeah. But we'll have the best time, Burke, I promise. He smiles, and there's this softness in his eyes. I freeze. And then the bell rings. Thank God. I should get to class. I stand quickly, almost upending my chair. Because, wow, I can't do this. I can't deal with Garrett's mushy eyes and Nick's broken heart. And I really can't be this head over heels for a straight girl. The head and heels need to get back in line. I need to fucking chill about this Abby situation. There honestly can't be an Abby situation. But I can't stop thinking about tomorrow afternoon. This mysterious after-school plan that Abby's concocting. She hasn't said a word about it all week, and I'm actually starting to wonder if she's forgotten about it entirely. But just as we're leaving English, she tugs the sleeve of my cardigan. Hey, are you taking the bus tomorrow? My stomach goes haywire. Like, seriously? Fuck this. Fuck you, butterflies. Stop acting like this is a rom-com moment. Am I taking the bus? That's seriously a step above discussing the weather. But for some reason, my body's decided to treat this like a marriage proposal. I blink and nod and exhale. Cool. I can drive you home. She grins. I'm excited. I can't even reply. I'm just a giant, steaming mess. The whole bus ride home, I'm like a blunder on pulse. In one moment, I think I finally have my shit together, and then the anticipation hits me in one megawatt burst. Tomorrow, I get to be alone with Abby. Which doesn't mean anything will happen. I'm pretty sure I'm trash for even wanting anything to happen. But I may actually be losing my mind. I'm in the weirdest mood. I'm this close to flinging my arms out and running up a mountainside, sound of music style. I feel reckless. And I want to do something. I get online as soon as I get home and log into my art tumbler. Because why shouldn't I? I don't even hesitate. I type some words and upload some pictures, and then I hold my breath and click post. Done. I link it to my sidebar. And probably no one even gives a shit, and I'll never hear from anyone. But in this moment, I don't care. I really don't. Because I did the thing, and I posted it, and now I feel like Bigfoot. Like every step I take leaves an imprint. It's right there on my Tumblr. I'm officially open for commissions. 28. But the Bigfoot feeling vanishes as soon as I get to school on Friday. Nick's at my locker, clearly waiting for me. He perks up as soon as I get there. Hey, I heard you're hanging out with Abby today. Um, I hesitate. Yeah, is that okay? He nods. Totally, of course. I don't want to get in the way of your friendship. He does this weird, strained laugh. It's so funny, because I didn't even know you guys were friends. But now you are. But, like, I'm totally cool with it. Are you sure? Very sure. So sure. He nods like a Muppet. Holy shit. I mean, he's falling apart, and this is over the idea of Abby and me as friends. Platonic, hetero, after-school friends. He would die if he knew. He would actually die. So, yeah. Hey, so, he stares at my forehead. Will you let me know if she mentions me? Sure. Cool. That's awesome. Oh, man, I really appreciate that. My stomach twists with guilt. Of course it's the longest day in the history of long days. Time is actually curdling. Abby finds me at my locker in the same exact spot where Nick stood this morning. Are you ready? She asks, smiling. For a moment, I just look at her. Her hair is pulled back, and her cheeks are almost glowing. I think she might be wearing eyeliner, but it's actually hard to know. The eyelash situation is that intense. And she's wearing a dress, short-sleeved and belted, over tights and ankle boots. The boots are from Athens, she says, catching me staring, and I almost choke on my own spit. I know, I say finally. I really like your dress, she says. It's the universe one, and I'm not going to lie. Other than my prom dress, it's the best thing I own. 
So, the weather is really perfect. I know exactly where I want to take you. Wow. Okay. Where she wants to take me? I don't want to lose my shit or anything, but she's really making this sound like a date. I'm good with whatever. I manage. Since when are you this agreeable? I'm super agreeable. I don't know what you're talking about, Suso. Every time you call me Suso, I feel like you're actually Garrett wearing a Leah mask. Are there Leah masks? There should be, Abby says. Then she turns down a side hall and down the back stairs. There's a set of double push doors at the end of the music hallway. And it's funny because I'm here all the time, but I've never even noticed them. Abby pushes and holds one open with her hip, and I step out into the soft afternoon warmth. We're in a courtyard behind the school, where a path cuts toward the football stadium. Are you making me play football? I ask. Because that's all I fucking need. Another weird, tense game of sports ball. Is this the universal post-breakup ritual? Obviously. You're a cornerback, right? Okay. Can I ask you something? Of course. I step onto the path, matching her pace. Are cornerback and quarterback actually two different things? Is that a real question? She seems amused. I figured it might just be lazy pronunciation. Okay, wow. You are way too cute. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. My cheeks are off the charts warm. I could grill steaks on them. I could break thermometers and straighten your hair and give you second-degree burns. Seriously, why are you taking me to the football field? Because you've clearly never seen one before. I buy back a smile. False? I attended a single game at UGA five years ago. Let me guess. With Morgan? Yeah. I roll my eyes. Did I tell you she apologized to me? She did? A few days ago. She seemed really messed up about it. She veers left, glancing over her shoulder to make sure I'm following. Then she leads me through a gap in the stands, onto the track that surrounds the football field. Well, she should be. She fucked up. She did. Abby nods. But I'm glad she apologized. Suddenly Abby takes off, jogging to the center of the field and plopping onto the grass. By the time I catch up to her, she's lying supine, propped up on her elbows. I settle in beside her. So, are you cool with her now? I guess so. She shrugs. I mean, I'm not going to lie. That comment sucked. It's just super hurtful. And I get it all the time. So then I get obsessed with the idea of proving people wrong and being, like, unimpeachably perfect. Which probably isn't healthy. And it's just really exhausting. I hate it. She sighs. But I also hate conflict, especially this close to graduation. So, I don't know. Yeah. I guess it's like, I forgive her, but I don't really know if I can trust her again. Does that make sense? Definitely. I nod. No, that makes perfect sense. Abby tilts her head toward me. But I think it's cool that you stood up for me. I wasn't standing up for you. I was standing up for decency. I mean, decency is cool too, she says, and the corners of her mouth tug up. I can't stop staring at her knees, the way the skirt of her dress drapes over them, fanning gently across the grass. Anyway, she scrunches her nose at me, which makes me scrunch my nose back at her. Don't do that, she says, covering her eyes. Don't do what? The thing, she waves her hand. The thing with the nose and the freckles. Oh my god, I don't get it. I tap my finger to my nose. She shakes her head hands still over her face. But then she peeks through them. You're just cute, she says softly. Oh, and now you're blushing. No, I'm not. Yes, you are, Abby says, which is also cute, so stop it. I can't believe she's doing this. Either she's teasing me, which makes her an asshole, or she's not, which I don't know. I lie back on the grass, tucking my knees up into triangles. She looks at me for a moment, and then she scoots closer, barely an inch of space between us, just like September of junior year on Morgan's bedroom floor. There's a breeze now, cool and soft, and I watch it ruffle her bangs. She's so beautiful, it makes my stomach hurt. I turn my head away quickly, eyes fixed on the clouds. I'm still not getting why you wanted to bring me here. 
I say finally. She laughs. I know. Then she inhales. I think she's actually nervous. I wanted to punch myself for picking Friday. Why? Because I've been wanting to tell you something since last weekend, and it's been torture. I sneak a peek at her face. She's staring straight at the sky, a ghost of a smile on her lips. You wanted to tell me something? Yes. Okay. I pause expectantly, but she just bites her lip without speaking. I look at her sidelong. So, are you going to tell me? Give me a second. I nod, and my heart thuds wildly. Okay, so? She takes a deep breath. I came out over the weekend. Came out like... You came out? Not to everyone, she says quickly. Not to my parents or anyone here. Just my cousins, the twins. She turns toward me. I was really nervous. Isn't that weird? Why would that be weird? I don't know, because they're like the gayest family ever. She shrugs. They took it really well, obviously. They were psyched. That's awesome. I catch her eye. Seriously, congrats. She grins and doesn't reply. And for a moment, we just lie there. So, wait. I say finally. Can I ask you something? Mm-hmm. What did you come out as? Abby laughs. What do you mean? Well, last I heard, you were straight, so... I don't think I'm straight, she says, and my heart almost stops. I don't know, she adds finally. I guess I'm, like, low-key bisexual? I don't think that's a thing. What? It totally is. She pokes my arm. Low-key bi. You're either bi or you're not. That's like being a little bit pregnant. That's a thing, too. Why can't you be a little bit pregnant? I think that's just called pregnant. Well, I'm a little bit bi, and I'm sticking with that. I sit up. I don't get you. What? I shake my head. Low-key bi, a little bit bi. Just be bi. Like, come on. What? No. She draws herself up. You don't get to decide my label. It's not a real label. Well, it's real for me. She exhales heavily. God, sometimes I don't even know. My jaw tightens. Don't even know what? What you want from me? She tilts her palms up. Like, can you just... I don't know. This is weird for me, okay? What I want from you? She nods, blinking quickly. Jesus Christ, Abby. I press my hands over my eyes. I want you to stop messing with my head. I'm not, seriously, low-key bi? I laugh flatly, otherwise known as what? You're bi, but you don't want to admit it? I'm not saying you have to march in a pride parade. You don't have to come out, but God, at least admit it to yourself. I shrug. Or don't. I don't care. Leah. I can't even look at her. God, it's just all so pointless. It's not like we ever had a shot to begin with. What the hell kind of shitty friend would even think of kissing her best friend's ex-girlfriend? Two weeks after the breakup. On the day before prom. And poor, clueless Garrett, whom I haven't bothered to rebuff. I can't jump into this now. I'm not even out. I stand abruptly, brushing my skirt down. Okay, yeah. I'm not doing this. I'm going to go. What? Abby blinks up at me. I'm going home. Let me drive you. I'll take the late bus. She hugs her knees. I'm trying, okay? There's a quiver in her voice. Are you serious? I clench my hands. You're trying? Trying to do what? I don't know. You know what? You want to be low-key by? Good for you. Have a blast. But if you're not all in, leave me the fuck out of it. Don't you dare come knocking on my door with your post-breakup identity crisis. I look her straight in the eye. You took my first kiss, Abby. You stole it. I am so... And everyone thinks you have your shit together. I swallow thickly. But you just do what you want and everyone gives you a free pass. And you don't even care who you hurt. Abby's face falls. You think I don't care? I don't know what to think. I mean, yeah, I'm not perfect. 
A tear rolls down her cheek. Okay? I'm completely fucking this up. I'm not like you. I don't have it all figured out. I have no clue what I'm doing, and I'm just really scared right now. Of what? I don't know. That I'll get this wrong. That you'll hate me. I don't hate you. Or that I'll hurt you. I don't want to do that. Time seems to freeze. For a moment, we just look at each other. I feel breathless and unsteady. Look, I'm fine. I say finally. Okay? You'll figure this out. You've got this. I'm happy for you. You don't owe me anything. I exhale, shrugging. That's not... Everything's fine. We're friends. I'll see you at prom. Okay, she says softly. I don't bother replying. I leave without looking back. 29. We're going to get this, I swear to God. Mom stares at the screen of her phone and then catches my eye in the mirror. I watched the tutorial like 50 times. I'm sure you did. I smile faintly. It's just not working. Why do I suck at this? You don't suck. There's this little loop of hair hanging awkwardly over my ear, so I give it a tug. And now there's one straight chunk of hair stringing down like a massive sideburn. Welp. Mom groans. I've spent the last hour in her bedroom, letting her knock herself out with every hair appliance ever invented. I'm still in pajamas, and Garrett's not coming for another five hours. But Mom's obsessively checking the time on her phone, like he might bust in at any moment. Okay, starting over. She combs her fingers through my hair, retrieving approximately 10,000 bobby pins. Then she spritzes it with water and brushes it straight again. I swear to God. For my part, I'm numb. I just can't muster any fucks to give. I get that prom's supposed to be a huge deal, but for what? Why the effort? I honestly don't care about impressing my date. And maybe some stupid, tiny part of me wants to impress someone. But if that someone is off limits, then what's the point? Mom licks her lips. Let me blow dry you again. Go for it. She goes for it. It's funny, I never even thought I'd go to prom, and here I am doing the whole routine that goes with it. We're taking pictures at Simon's house, and then writing an actual limo to some fancy pants restaurant in Alpharetta. It's just a real suburban high school wet dream. Mom turns off the dryer. I hate that you're fighting with Morgan and Anna, she says out of nowhere. Why? I just don't like that there's tension. I want you to have that perfect night. That's a myth. What's a myth? The perfect prom night? Mom laughs. What do you mean? It's like a teen movie cliche. You have the choreographed group dance number, and the weird pining eye contact, and then the big smoochy kiss. That sounds like a great prom, Mom says. It's a joke. God, Leah. She trails her hands through my hair and loops a strand of it around her finger. How did you get so cynical? I can't help it. I'm a Slytherin. And I'm the worst kind of Slytherin. I'm the kind who's so stupidly in love with the Gryffindor, she can't even function. I'm the Draco from some shitty dreary fic that the author abandoned after four chapters. Well, my prom was beautiful, Mom says. It was one of the most romantic nights of my life. Weren't you pregnant? So? It was still wonderful, she smiles. Did you know I had an ultrasound the day before my prom? That's... cool? It was cool. It was the big one, too. That's when I found out your gender. Gender is a social construction. I know, I know. She pokes my cheek. I don't know. I was just so excited about it. I didn't even care what sex you were. I just wanted to know everything about you. I snort. That sounds about right. I just perfectly remember lying there on the table, seeing you on the little monitor. You were so... fetal? Yes, she grins. But also... I don't know. You were just such a little trooper in there. I remember being so moved by that. Here I was, with all this stuff going on. School and prom and your dad. But you just kept doing your thing. Growing and growing. You were unstoppable. I think that's like bare minimum fetus achievement. 
I don't know. I just found it so amazing. I still do. Look at you. I glance up in the mirror, meeting her eyes. And for a moment, we were both silent. When mom finally speaks, it's almost a whisper. Everyone was always telling me how fast it goes. It used to piss me off. Huh. Like, it was always some random lady in the grocery store. You'd be flailing around, pitching a fit, and every single time, some jerk would just have to come up and tell me I'd miss it one day. Oh, she'll be off to college before you know it. Enjoy these moments now. I was like, cool story, fuck you. She twists the lock of my hair around the curling iron. But they were so right. It happens. I just can't believe you're leaving. Mom blinks a little too quickly. You realize I'll be an hour and a half away, right? I know, I know. She smiles sadly. But you know what I mean. I wrinkle my nose at her. Don't you dare cry. Why? Because you'll cry? No way. Never. Mom laughs softly. It's going to be so weird here without you, Leah. Mom! Okay, I'll stop. I don't want you sobbing over me and ruining your prom aesthetic. My prom aesthetic? I roll my eyes, smiling. Mom smiles back. You're going to have so much fun tonight, Lee. It's going to be weird. Even if it's weird, I loved my weird messy prom night. She shrugs. Just embrace it. That's what I did. I remember looking in the mirror and deciding my prom was going to be suck-free, even if it wasn't going to be how I imagined it. Well, mine's going to suck. I make a face at her in the mirror. But why? It doesn't have to. She leans forward, resting her chin on my head. Just promise me you won't overthink this. Then it hits me, like a kick in the crotch. Fuck. Mom meets my eyes in the mirror, brows raised. You okay? I'm such an idiot. I highly doubt that. I don't have a bra. Hmm. Mom tucks the final strand of hair in place and smiles. Not bad, right? I mean, yeah. Mom knocked it out of the park. I don't know how she did it, but my hair is smooth and wavy, swept back on the sides, with little soft pieces hanging down around my cheeks. Of course, the fact that I'm still in pajamas makes it seem like my head and body belong to two different people. But I guess it will look good with a dress. Except for the fact that I don't have a fucking bra. I need something strapless. You don't have a strapless bra? Why would I have a strapless bra? Mom's mouth quirks. Because you have a strapless dress? Okay, it's not funny. I'm kind of freaking out. Lee. She rests her hands on my shoulders. We have a few hours until Gary gets here. We can buy you a bra. From where? From anywhere. How about Target? Go throw on some jeans. She grabs her purse. Let's hit it. Except the car won't start. Nope, Mom says as the key clicks uselessly. Not today, Satan. Are you kidding me? Hold on. She nudges the steering wheel and opens and closes her door. I'm trying again. Still nothing. She looks vaguely panicked. Should I blow on the key? That's not a thing, Mom. Oh, come on, she mutters, smacking her hands down on the steering wheel. Of all fucking days. Okay, please don't say fucking. She shoots me a self-conscious glance. I thought we liked cussing. We love cussing, but we say the fucking G. I don't want to hear that apostrophe, Mom. I can't believe this, she says. I nod. It's the sign. Of what? That I should stay home? Now Mom's rolling her eyes. You want to miss prom because of a bra? Because of the lack of a bra, I correct her. And because I have no way of getting a bra. Mom doesn't respond. She just digs into her purse for her phone. Then she taps into her favorite contacts. Who are you calling? She ignores me. Oh, hell no. I make a grab for the phone, but she yanks it out of reach. Are you calling Wells? No response. She presses send. Please tell me you're not asking Wells to buy me a fucking bra. Why not? The phone starts ringing. Because it's a bra. So? So, that's disgusting. What, a bra? 
You're grossed out by bras? I open my mouth, but she just keeps talking. Man, if you can't handle bras, wait till you learn about boobs. Hi, honey! She cuts herself off, and her whole demeanor changes. I picture Wells on the other end of the call, phone mashed up to his tiny ear. I smack her in the arm, and she turns to me and winks. Leah and I need a favor. I shake my head frantically, but Mom turns away, ignoring me. So, the car just died, and we just realized that Leah doesn't have... I hug my arms across my chest. Something she needs, Mom continues. Then she pauses. I can just barely hear Wells' voice through her speaker. Right, not till five. She pauses again and then laughs. Yeah, totally dead. Then she nods and flicks her eyes toward me, smiling. Thanks, hun. Love you. Okay, first of all, ick. Second of all, oh fudge. So Mom and Wells are at the love you stage? That's pretty fucking vomity. She ends the call and turns toward me. He'll be here in 15 minutes to jump the car. Great. Uh, you're welcome. She raises her eyebrows. I blush. Thanks. And it's weird. We don't move from the car. We don't even unbuckle our seatbelts. It's like someone paused the universe. Everything smells like hairspray, and I have that key change, offbeat feeling again. That little itch in my gut. Mom drums on the steering wheel, humming. So, are you and Wells secretly engaged or something? Her hands freeze. What? Where did that come from? It's just a question. Mom sighs. Leah, no. I'm not secretly engaged. Are you getting engaged? Um, she smiles. Not that I know of. Would you say yes if he asked you? Leah, back up a minute. Where are you getting this? It's just a hypothetical question. I tuck my feet onto the seat and turn toward the window. Everything's sun-soaked and green. Stupid, perfect April day. If he asked me today? I don't know, Mom says. Marriage is a big thing. I know I love him a lot. I look at her. Why? Why do I love Wells? I get the money thing, obviously. Um, excuse me? Mom's eyes flash. You know what? That's really hurtful, and it's not true. Then I don't get it. Don't get what? I mean, you're not marrying him for looks, I say. And before the words are even out of my mouth, I regret it. I feel heat rise in my cheeks. I don't know why I'm so mean. Okay, seriously? I'm sorry, I mutter. You know, I happen to think he's really handsome. I know, I get it. I'm a jerk. You don't think he looks a little like Prince William? Uh, isn't Wells, like, 50? He's 42. Still. Like a slightly older, balder Prince William? I'm just talking about his face. She pokes my knee. You totally see it. Fuck, I totally do. And even his name is so on point. So this whole relationship is literally a thing because of your lifelong Prince William fetish? Okay, it's not a fetish. I just think he's sexy. You did not just call Prince William sexy. I did. It had to be said. She smiles, almost sadly. You know, you'd probably really like him if you gave him half a chance. I don't have to like him. I'm graduating, remember? Oh, man. Do I remember? And something about the way she says it makes my heart catch in my throat. I stare at the glove compartment, hugging my knees. Sorry, I mutter. Sweetie, it's fine, you know? It's just... She cuts herself off as Wells pulls up next to us in his beamer. He looks extra golfy today, in a tucked-in polo shirt, and now I can't unsee the Prince William thing. So that's a little disturbing. He pops open the hood of his car, and Mom pops ours open beside it car foreplay for this car booty call. Mom slides out of the driver's seat and fishes a set of jumper cables out of the trunk. I watch from the passenger seat as they clip their little alligator mouths somewhere in the mess of engine and battery parts. A moment later, Wells starts his car, and Mom leans in through the driver's side door. Lee, try twisting the ignition. I do, and it roars to life immediately. 
So that's it? I ask. You fixed it? Well, it started, which is good, but we'll need to keep the battery running for a while. Why don't you hop to the back? Why? Because Wells is going to drive us to Target, so he can keep the car running while we run in. Oh, okay. God, prom errands with Wells. But I guess he technically did just come to rescue us, and technically I should be grateful. Or something. Mom fills Wells in on prom gossip the whole way to Target. She remembers every detail I've ever mentioned. Okay, Abby dumped Nick, so that's the main thing. But there's also Morgan creating issues, Mom explains. And Garrett has a crush on Leah. I lean forward. That's hearsay. But, Mom plows on, twisting around to smile at me. I think Leah likes someone else. Mom! Holy shit! Like, she better not be implying what I think she's implying. I'm just saying, she grins. It's going to be an interesting night. As soon as we pull into the parking lot, Mom's phone rings. Oh, crap, I need to get that. She answers it, scrunching her face at me apologetically and mouthing, work. Awesome fucking timing. For a minute, Wells and I just sit there while Mom nods and says, "Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Right. Uh Uh-huh. She gropes in her purse for a pen and scribbles a few things down on the back of a receipt. Well, I really... Oh. Oh. Okay. No, no. She shoots me a look that's half guilty, half frantic. Mm Mm-hmm, she murmurs. Then she unbuckles her seatbelt and twists back to meet my eyes. I look back at her and raise my eyebrows. Yes, okay, absolutely, she says into the phone. But she nods her head pointedly at me. Then she passes me her credit card. I'm supposed to do this myself? I ask quietly. She shrugs, gestures at her phone and then points at the clock on the card's dashboard, which has been broken for years, but I get what she's saying. Garrett will be at our house in two hours, and I'm wearing jeans and not a trace of makeup. I'll go with you, says Wells. Um, that's not necessary. It's actually perfect. I need to pick up a birthday card anyway. I shoot Mama a look that says, Are you fucking kidding me? She shrugs and tips her hands up, eyes twinkling. So isn't this magical? I'm bra shopping with Wells. He shoves his hands in his pockets as we walk through the parking lot. So, what is it that you need? An item of clothing? An item of clothing? He shoots me a confused smile. Am I supposed to guess? No, I say quickly. Fuck my life. Just, it's a bra. For my boobs, Wells. Ah. Now I can't even think straight. Maybe my brain is boiling. Maybe that's the thing that happens when you achieve peak mortification. We step through the automatic doors, and the first thing I see is a bag display. Giant canvas zipper totes and faux leather purses, and already a summary display of woven beach bags. Oh no, I smack my forehead. Everything okay? Wells asks. I don't have a purse. I mean, technically, I do, but the only purse I own is a ratty canvas thing I bought three years ago from Old Navy. I can't bring that piece of shit to prom. Okay, we've got this, he nods eagerly. Would any of these purses work? And shoes. I don't have shoes. Okay, I'm honestly starting to freak out, because this really feels like a sign now. No bra, no shoes, no purse, car battery dead, mom occupied. Universe, I hear you loud and clear. I shouldn't have even considered going to prom. I should go back home and watch HGTV and return the dress as soon as the mall opens tomorrow. I just wish... I don't know. I wish I were the kind of girl who remembered things like bras and shoes and purses. It's like there's a prom gene and I'm missing it. And I guess it makes sense. I can barely be trusted to dress myself normally. No surprise I'm a hot mess and a half when it comes to this crap. This is cool, Wells says, holding up a little clutch. It's made of gold fake leather, and it's shaped like a cat's face. And even I have to admit it's adorable. I bite my lip. How much is it? He checks the tag. Oh, it's just $20.
Welp, never mind. Leah, I can cover that. I laugh. Yeah, no. I mean it. Seriously, don't worry about it. God, I really hate this. Literally, the last person I want buying me shit is Wells. He's not my stepdad. He's definitely not my dad. And it's just weird and uncomfortable, and I feel like a sellout. But, I don't know. I also don't want to carry a canvas bag to prom. I'm going to go find a bra, I say quickly, eyes starting to prickle. This is all so ridiculous. And honestly, I don't even know how I'm supposed to do this without mom. I don't know anything about strapless bras. I don't know how they're supposed to fit. I don't even know if I'm allowed to try them on. I end up circling the racks in the lingerie area, probably looking like a little lost turtle. Finally, I grab the cheapest one in my size, but even the cheapest one is almost $25. For a bra, I'm probably going to wear one time. And if I'm paying $25 for a bra, there's no way I can buy shoes. I'll have to wear my sneakers. Just some giant, ugly-ass sneakers. Now I'll really have a prom aesthetic. I may be feeling slightly hysterical. Slightly. Wells is already holding a Target bag when I find him at the self-checkout. He smiles and rubs the back of his neck. Okay, I know you didn't want me to, but I got the cat purse. Seriously? It's just... I thought you'd probably try to push back, and then I'd insist, and we'd go back and forth. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so... He bites his lip. If you don't want to use it, that's totally fine. Oh. Um... I stare at the bag. I would have grabbed some shoes, too, but I didn't know what size. That's... fine. That's really cool of you, Wells. It's weird. I'm used to saying his name with a sarcastic kind of emphasis. A tiny vocal eye roll. Saying Wells without that little bite feels strange and incomplete. I pay for the bra with Mom's card, and we head back to the car. But when we get there, Mom's still on the phone, so Wells and I lean against the trunk, side by side. So, are you excited? He asks. For prom? Yeah, he shrugs. I never went to mine. I never thought I would. Just don't forget to bring a camera. Your mom's going to want pictures. My camera? I mean, of course Wells would suggest that. As if I'm going to roll into prom with a giant old-timey camera and a tripod. Maybe I should skip the camera altogether. I'll just bring some oil paints and a fucking easel. I guess you'll have your phone for that, huh? Uh, yeah. I smile. He smiles back. And for a minute, we just stand there. Thanks for the purse, by the way. I say finally. I scuff my shoe on the asphalt. You didn't have to do that. I was happy to. Well, I appreciate it. I say, blushing faintly. Because apparently I'm not capable of thanking people without making it awkward. Wells probably thinks I'm ridiculous, getting so flustered over a $20 purse. $20 is probably nothing to him. He probably uses 20s as toilet paper. But Wells just shakes his head. I know this kind of thing can be really uncomfortable. I used to hate receiving gifts. Me too. Even if I knew the person could afford it. I just didn't like feeling like I was getting a handout. He looks at me, and it's as if he's reading my mind. I didn't have a lot of money growing up. Really? He nods. Yeah. I was kind of the poor kid in the rich neighborhood. My friends all had houses, and we were in this tiny little apartment. I don't think some people even realize there are apartments in the suburbs. Wow. Wow? I just... I don't know. I totally figured you were kind of a country club kid. Well, I was, in a way. He smiles. I was a caddy. That is... a golf thing, isn't it? Nailed it, he says. And it's strange. I feel lighter. Like maybe this nerdy dude can stick around if he wants. Maybe Mom could use a bootleg Prince William to distract her. I guess it's either that or haunting the aisles of Publix, warning the baby moms how fast it all flies by. Here's the thing, though. No one ever warns the babies. 30. Garrett's exactly on time, and I step out onto the front stoop to meet him. He looks at me, opens his mouth, and shuts it. I think it's the first time I've ever seen him speechless.
Holy shit, Burke, he says finally. Holy shit, Laughlin. I tug the end of my hair. I guess I do feel kind of pretty. Now that I'm dressed, the hair totally works. And I've got the rosy cheeks thing, and the smoky eye thing, and the freckled shoulder thing all happening at once. And, as it turns out, my boots are the exact same shade of gold as my cat purse. So that's a thing that's happening. I'm wearing combat boots to prom. Garrett just stares at my mouth. I guess I'm glad he's not staring at my boobs. He gives me a bone-white corsage for my wrist, and Mom helps me pin a boot near to the lapel of his tux. Then she herds us outside the house for the photo shoot from hell. It doesn't help that Garrett has no clue where his hands go. First, he hooks his arm around my waist, then my shoulders, then back around my waist. I half expect him to whip out his phone to consult Google on the issue. When it's finally time to go, he opens the car door for me, and it's honestly super weird to be wearing a prom dress in Garrett's mom's minivan. Garrett's as quiet tonight as I've ever seen him. I can't help but steal a few glances at his profile. You clean up nicely, Garrett, I say finally. And it's true. Garrett's so annoying half the time that it's hard to remember he's handsome. But he is. He's got a nice jawline and thick hair and those bright blue eyes. So do you, he says. Really. For a moment, he's quiet. Are you excited for prom? I guess. You guess? I love your enthusiasm, Burke. Wait, let me try again. I clear my throat. I guess, exclamation point. He laughs. Much better. I look at him and smile, but I feel this quiet smack of guilt. Because Garrett really is so funny and decent. He'd probably be a great boyfriend. He's just not for me. And I should probably tell him that. Hey, Garrett, just a heads up. All that movie prom stuff you're picturing isn't happening. There will be no choreographed dance, no longing eye contact, definitely no smoochy prom kiss. Hey, Garrett, I'm sort of painfully in love with someone else. At least I finally get the point of tuxedos. They make boys 75% cuter. And it's not just Garrett, it's all of them. I almost die when I see Nick, Simon, and Bram. Currently, Simon, Bram, Nora, and Cal are enduring an epic photo shoot with the parents. Nick sitting alone on the stoop, tapping his fingers on the edge of the bricks. But Anna runs straight toward me, Morgan trailing behind. And because I've turned into an actual cliche, I jump straight into the whole routine. Oh my god, I love your dress! Oh my god, are you so excited? Anna looks too cute. She really does. She's wearing a two-piece gown with just a hint of tummy showing, and her hair is pinned up and braided. Anna and Morgan are both really tiny, and sometimes when I'm around them, I feel like the Hulk. But no, because my brain can shut up for fucking once. Hello, brain. Please let me feel beautiful. I think I actually do feel beautiful. Morgan shoots me a cautious smile. You look so gorgeous, Leah. I freeze. I should have prepared for this. I knew I'd have to be around her, but I kept putting that out of my mind. She did apologize. And Abby forgives her. I mean, that's something. Thanks, I say. So do you. Can we talk? She asks softly. It's strange. I keep going back to what Anna said, that maybe I've blown the situation up to make the goodbye feel smaller. I'm pretty sure that's bullshit. Morgan fucked up all on her own. It's not like I asked her to be racist so I'd miss her less. Okay, I say finally. I glance back at the dogwood, where Simon's dad is zooming in for awkward close-ups of Nora's and Cal's faces. I gesture vaguely at the road. Over there? That works. There's this weird, taut silence as we walk down the driveway. I tug my skirt forward and settle onto the curb. Morgan's eyes keep flicking toward me, like she's waiting for me to speak. But I don't know what to say. I don't even know what to feel. She leans back on her hands and sighs. So, I apologize to Abby. I heard. For a minute, we both sit there, looking anywhere but at each other. I fucked up, she says finally. I can't believe I said what I said. I feel so shitty about it. You should. I know. She shuts her eyes. I know. Like, yeah, I was upset. 
I was so... God, I can't even explain what that felt like, getting rejected. But that's not an excuse, Morgan. Oh, I know. It's not. It's not okay. Like, I call myself an ally. She exhales. But then the second it gets personal, it all flies out the window. I'll never forget that I said that. Yeah. And you don't have to forgive me. I get that. I just wanted you to know I'm so fucking sorry. I'm going to do better. I glance at her sidelong. Her lips are pressed together, and her brows are knitted tightly. She's so painfully sincere. It's written all over her face. But secondhand forgiveness is so messy. I never know where to land. If Abby's over it, should I be? If Simon forgives Martin, should I forgive him, too? I open my mouth to speak. I don't even know what I'm about to say. Before I can say anything, Garrett appears. Hey, so the limo guy's around the corner. Has anyone heard from Abby? Oh, she's not here yet? I cringe as soon as I say it. I'm even worse than Taylor. Abby's not here yet? Wow, I totally didn't notice. It's not like I've been obsessively scanning the road for her car. God, what if she skips prom? What if she can't handle the awkwardness? I should text her, just to check in. I even start to pull my phone out of my purse. But just the thought of it makes my heart sink. What would I even say? Eventually, Simon drifts over, hooking an arm around my shoulders. Okay, Abby's almost here. She's stuck in traffic. We should go ahead and do group pictures, though. We'll just do the guys first. Then he leans in and whispers straight in my ear. You look amazing. Psh. I'm just saying. So do you. He grins and tugs my hair, and then he collects Garrett for pictures. Cal's already left with Nora, but Simon's dad lines the rest of the guys up under the dogwood tree. They're quite a squad, I'm not going to lie. They look like a boy band. Garrett's easily the tallest, so Mr. Spear puts him in the middle, with Bram and Simon on one side and Nick on the other. They're all doing the prom dude pose with their hands clasped near their crotches, while Simon's mom frantically snaps pictures. It's pretty amazing. But I've got one eye on the road, and every time a car approaches, my heart starts pounding. I know she's almost here, but it feels like that moment won't ever arrive. Time is dragging so slowly, and everything's blurry and dreamlike. I try to focus on the warmth of the sun on my shoulders, anything to keep me centered. I feel like I've swallowed a helium balloon. Then Abby's car pulls up, and my whole brain clicks into place. Her mom turns into Simon's driveway, and Abby slides out of the passenger seat, gripping her skirt in one hand and holding a clutch in the other. She lets her skirt fall. And fuck my life forever. She looks like a cloud. Or a ballerina. Her whole dress is pale blue tulle, light as air, with straps crossed neatly between her shoulder blades. Her hair is pinned up loosely, her bangs swept to the side, and her lips and cheeks are soft and pink. It's too much. I swear to God. This girl is too much, and I'm way too far gone. She looks at me, and her eyes flare wide. Wow. She mouths. For a moment, I just stare at her. 24 hours ago, I was yelling at her on a football field, and now she's grinning at me like it's the easiest thing in the world. I can't decide if I'm relieved or gutted. Like, come on, you're not even going to be awkward about that? Not even a little? I'm jolted back to earth by Simon's mom, who sidles between Abby and me, clapping her hands together. Your paparazzi awaits! She's wearing an oversized red t-shirt that says, in giant black letters, Fear the Squirrel. Why should we fear the squirrel? I ask. Because, she says. And then she turns around to show off the back of her shirt, which has a picture of a squirrel and the words, Haverford Mom. Their mascot is a squirrel? Asks Abby. I catch Simon's eye across the driveway. Bram knows? I mouth. He tilts his head, looking confused. I take out my phone and text him. Bram knows about Haverford? Simon pulls his phone out of his back pocket, glances at the screen, and grins. He writes back, he knows, smiley emoji. We head over to the dogwood, and Simon's dad arranges us for pictures. Peak awkwardness. I don't know if Simon's parents are clueless or if they're messing with me, but they seem determined to place me between Abby and Garrett and every fucking picture. 
except the ones where I'm supposed to stand by Morgan. Huddle up close, guys. Act like you like each other. How do parents do this? How do they always manage to say true things without knowing they're true? Mr. Spear is just about to step in it by demanding a couple shot of Nick and Abby, but Simon heads it off at the pass, and then the limo pulls up. I slide in between Garrett and Nick while Simon's mom pokes her head in to snap more pictures. The inside of the limo is essentially a strip club. Not that I've actually been inside a strip club. But there are seats on both sides and a thin, fluorescent stripe along the wall, like a color-changing glow stick. And there's a mini bar with bottles of water instead of booze. But still, I feel like I've stepped into someone else's life, like a Kardashian or Beyonce. I don't want to look out the windows, or I'll remember we're in Shady Creek. I bet people think we're famous, says Simon. I mean, that's what I'd assume, seeing a limo full of high school kids rolling through the suburbs in April, Abby says. Definitely a film premiere. Or the Oscars, chimes Bram. Couldn't be prom. Shut up, Simon grinned and elbows both of them at once. Then Garrett stretches and, honest to God, slips his arm behind my shoulders. Master of subtlety. I scoot forward, just an inch. Far enough to put a little space between us, but not far enough for anyone to notice. Except Abby notices. She raises her eyebrows, almost imperceptibly, and shoots me a tiny, secret smile. And yeah, holy shit, this is going to be quite a night.